I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you'll notice that for, for uh, last week and this week, we have been reading in our gospel portion from the Gospel of John. And um, before that, for most of the year, during what we call lectionary year B, right, the lectionary is, there's three years, A, B, and C, and year B, uh, which began at the beginning of Advent last year, Year B focuses on the Gospel of Mark. But there's only three, it's only a three-year cycle, and there's four Gospels, right? And so what is done is that the Gospel of John is interspersed in key moments throughout the lectionary. So through most of the year, we read from Mark, but then in these key moments, we hear from the Gospel of John. And I, I think that's really interesting. One of, one of the things, one of the places where we hear from John every year, actually, is on Christmas morning. The appointed gospel for that morning is the first chapter of John. You know, we do Luke or Matthew the night before, right, where, where with, it has all the, the mangers and the angels, etc. But on, on Christmas morning, we do, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then again, during Lent and, and throughout the... Um, Holy Week, we, there, are, there are different parts that we take from the Gospel of John. Last week, we heard from toward the beginning of John this story of how Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And, and there, I mean, it's one of the most famous passages of Scripture, right, where Jesus says, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave the on, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall be saved, right? And last week, again, that part of that that um, lesson was Jesus references the story of Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness and, and the snakes biting people. And Moses um, puts up this pole with a snake on it, right? And, and Jesus talks about how in the same way he is going to be lifted up. And so again, uh, what, nine chapters later in the Gospel of John, we get this story. And again, Jesus references that, that idea that he is about to be lifted up so that all people will be drawn to him. What's interesting about this story or this passage in John, it comes right in the middle of the book. John chapter 12 is, is pretty much dead middle of the gospel of John. And everything that has happened before is is our stories from Jesus' ministry at various times. And, and in fact, John is not so concerned with chron chronology. So, uh, but you have all these different stories, the wedding in Cana, the uh, driving out of, of people from the temple. Um, we, we heard that one a few weeks ago. And, and, uh, but then in, in 12, Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. And for the whole rest of the book, for the next 12 chapters, it's, these, it's, it's very compressed the Gospel of John tells us, narrates the story, but also gives us the, the prayers and the inner thoughts and the teaching that Jesus gave all within that last week of his life, from what we call Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. And so this is that kind of turning point. Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. It's, it's actually, you know, after um, the story that we're going to focus on next week, right? The time gets all wonky here. Um, so so G the palms have been waved, and people have said, Hosanna, and Jesus is now uh, in Jerusalem. He's teaching in the temple, and these non-Jewish people, these Greek believers in God who are allowed to be in the outer court of the temple, but they're not allowed to go any further into the temple, they come to Philip, who has a Greek name, so we, we probably, um, he probably speaks Greek, Right? And, he, and they say to Philip, we want to see Jesus. And so then Jesus launches into these incredible things that he has to say about being lifted up so that he can draw all people to him. But it's, it's really about his purpose and, and the meaning of, of what he is doing, why he has come. Right? He says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
And so he's preparing his followers for what is about to unfold for that last week of his life. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies. He's talking about his own death. Unless I be raised, or when I am raised up. He's talking about how he'll be lifted up on the cross. And of course, the the disciples, this is all very um, disturbing to them. And, and he, um, it's even disturbing to Jesus, right? Jesus is fully human. And so we have this extraordinary passage where he talks about how he is troubled, deeply troubled, and, and the kind of struggle that's going on in his own heart. Should I ask Father to be, to be saved from this time of, of trouble? But I want to go back to uh, you know, Jesus says some pretty extraordinary things there, but I want to go back to what the Greeks say real quick. So these, these people who have come to Jerusalem for the Passover, who are not, um, are, are not Jewish, but they still worship the, the, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that thing they say just kind of, it just kind of catches me every time I read it. It's, he's, they say, Sir... We want to see Jesus. That's perhaps the shortest, most succinct prayer in all of Scripture. Sir, we want to see Jesus. And so as we prepare to live, um, in in a sense, to to not not as sort of dramatize or to sort of make a a play out of the last week of Jesus... But we, we do live in it. We sort of inhabit it through these extraordinary um, rituals and, and services and, and readings. And, and it's very immersive. And, and you can sort of, if you allow yourself, you can sort of be taken away with it. So as we enter into that time, that Holy Week, where we're going to wave palm branches and, and we're going to do all sorts of weird, we're going to wash each other's feet. I mean, a lot of weird stuff is about to happen. But don't lose sight of that simple, simple prayer. We want to see Jesus. That's all we're doing. That's all our our purpose is. It's the only meaning that we have for anything that we do here. It's simply, we want to see Jesus. Because Jesus says, if you ask, you shall receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened to you. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as showing up and asking. You know, the, the, the life of a Christian, what, what we call discipleship, Jesus talks about it here in this passage. It's, it is arduous, right? Following Jesus, in one sense, it is a serious and arduous path to take, right? Jesus says, those who love their lives will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it. For eternal life. But in another sense, it's all really quite simple. It's just about showing up and about asking to see Jesus. That's it. Just being faithful, just showing up and then looking for where you can see Jesus here and now in your own life. Jesus' Jesus' response, as, as I've sort of talked about he says he's really extraordinary things and, and some of them are kind of cryptic um, and and it doesn't seem like it is a direct answer to the request of these people to see jesus but that last thing that he says if i be lifted up i will draw all people to me that really is the answer jesus being lifted up on the cross as one of our hymns that we sang a minute ago it it is a universal sign of healing and salvation. It is God's definitive act of salvation, not just for some, but for everyone. So that no matter who you are, no matter what your ethnicity is, you can see Jesus. You know, that last week when we talked about the snake lifted on the pole, we talked about how that was the glory of God, God's glorification, God's being lifted up is his death on the cross. God's glory is shown through God's weakness, God's self-sacrificing love, God's willingness 
to be in the midst of the muck and of the mire, the disappointments and the pain of human life, and God's willingness ultimately to undergo a human death, even death on the cross. So as we enter Holy Week, let that be our prayer. I want to see Jesus and think about that image again of the snake on the pole, of of Jesus being lifted up, and all we have to do is show up and look at Jesus. That's the sum total of our responsibility, and God does the rest. Where the, the song that we're going to end this service with is one of my like top five favorite hymns. Like I've got, I've got at least five that I absolutely require Jamie to play um, every year. And one of them is In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Man, I love that song. And so I'll, I'll end just by reading a little bit and, and, and tell, maybe telling you a little of the story. It says, In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. When the woes of life o'ertake me, hope deceives and fears annoy, never shall the cross forsake me. Lo, it glows with peace and joy. Do you remember in uh, 2019 when Notre Dame in Paris was, was seriously damaged in that fire? And there's those striking images of how the, the roof caved in to the nave. And you're looking toward the altar, and there's just like smoldering carnage all around. But there's a cross behind the altar, and it's just like shining with this radiance. And you can't tell where the light is coming from. That's such a, uh, it became such an incredible image of, of hope. This cross, undamaged and undisturbed, even in the wrecks of time, even when everything else is in total dis- disarray. The, the hymn itself, um, the guy who wrote it, John Bowring, wrote the hymn when he was visiting China. And as the story goes, he visited uh, St. Ba- Paul's Cathedral in Macau, and the cathedral had just been destroyed by a typhoon, and only one of its four walls was standing and everything was destroyed, all the windows were, were smashed out, but there was a cross on the top. And the contrast between the sky and, and the carnage and the ruins and this single cross. And that's what inspired him to write that song. And the examples could pile up, right? You can remember the I-beam cross that was left in the wreckage of the World Trade Center in 9-11. Or there's this cross that was made of nails fused together that was found in the ruins of Coventry Cathedral after that building was destroyed by the Germans in World War II. That image is so, so resonant for me in, in, in every uh, time of life, right? Whether you are... Um, in a time of grieving, whether you are in a time of great joy, great pain, great fear, great annoyance, the cross stands over the wrecks of time. And so, let us come then as those Greek people did, saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And then all we have to do is look at the cross the cross that stands or the wreck of time, the wrecks of our life. Look at the cross and live. The symbol of death and shame has been transformed into a sign of victory and hope. Amen.